what we know about Jesus is that he loved people, really loved people. He knew how to love people like nobody else knew how to love people. So we find Jesus standing on a, on a mountain talking to a group of people and he's, and he's laying stuff out there that they've never heard before and they're really moved by what they're hearing. And he goes through what we now know is the Sermon on the Mount. And when he's down there in Matthew 5, down around verse 14 or so, he, he brings this statement out and it, and it had to surprise a lot of them because in that crowd, think about the crowd Jesus was speaking to. I mean, there was every, every kind of person you can imagine in that crowd. This wasn't a church service. This is a bunch of people who had heard about a man healing people and they wanted to come see what was going on. Some of them said, he's, he's the Messiah, you gotta come. Some said, he's really cool. Some said, he's, 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 um, he's blaspheming God. There was just a bunch of people there for a bunch of different reasons. And Jesus is teaching to them. And in the middle of it all, after laying out the first section, he stops and he says this to them. He says, you're the salt of the earth. Right? You're the salt of the earth. And if salt loses its flavor, it's, it's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under feet by men. But you're the salt of the earth. And he goes on. I'm going to skip around just a little bit. Then he, he goes on and says, you're the light of the world. Now, stop and think about that. He's talking to all these people, many of which will probably not end up following him. Some will. Many won't. They're listening to him. And he says this to these people. Now, the question is, who is he really talking to, right? He's, he's saying it to the entire crowd, but who is Jesus really talking to when he says, you are the salt of the earth? You are the light. Because you can only imagine Jesus engaged people when he spoke. He didn't talk over them. He didn't talk to the back wall. He spoke to people. And they saw in his eyes that he loved them. So when he said, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. Who was he talking to? The point, the first little point I wanna make is, is this, that when you come in these services and you sit, often when you begin to worship him, your heart is moved towards him. You, you just begin to feel moved. And often if you're new in church, you don't know what it is. What is that? What am I feeling? And I believe Jesus was speaking to those people that when he spoke those words, his words became life to them. They were leaning in. Their hearts began to beat fast because his words were truth and they were life and they were hope. And this is who Jesus was talking to. Every now and then Jesus would say something like, um, to him who has ears, let him hear, right? Remember when he would say those things? This is one of those moments that Jesus was saying, those of you who can hear me now, you, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. He was talking to people in the crowd that were moved by what he was saying, who could hear what he was saying. I mean, people that were just, couldn't believe the words they were hearing. When Jesus said, you're the light of the world, and this is interesting, it really means that you, because I believe Jesus was talking to that crowd and to everyone who would ever come into him, anyone who would ever come to him and come into his heart, anyone who would ever take Jesus and follow him, he was speaking to the future church. You are the, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And the word the right there, you're the light of the world is really interesting because in the language, it actually is an exclusive word. And it means the only one, like, you are the only light of the world talking to this people, these, these, this church. You are the only light to the world. The world has no other light. In John 9, 5, Jesus declared, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Remember that? But see, Jesus no longer is here physically. So you are the light of the world. We are his representatives. And his place we're the only light of the world. There is no other religion. There is no other confidence. There's no other self-help class. We are the, the one and only light of the world. 
This is why so many people don't like Christianity. It's called the exclusivity of Christ, this principle where they say, I just don't buy that. There's gotta be more than one way to God. It's very insulting to all the other gods, but Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The exclusivity of God sets him apart. He's the only one who claimed to be savior and said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So in his place, we are the only light to the world. And if we do not give light, there is no other source that the light can come from. And John 1, 4 says this, in him was life and the life was the light of men. Listen, you are the life of the world. The first time I heard that, it was a teenager. And I thought, it just kind of went past me. That's for other people. Because I'm a goofball who can't even pay attention three quarters of the time. Who's got so many troubles in my own heart and mind. My biggest concern was if there would be a fight when I got home or or what else would happen or if I was going to get in trouble for the many things that I did. And I did a lot of stuff. And for someone to say, you are the light of the world, didn't land on me in that moment. But over the next months, as the teacher kept saying, you, Rick, are the light of the world. You, Rick, are the salt of the earth. And God began to move in my life. This is what's amazing. Almost immediately, he began to give me a burden for my friends. And I was a mess. But he gave me a burden for my friends. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light, the only light in your world. I invited a buddy from school named Jerry Poston. He was a cool kid, funny. I gravitated to funny people. And I invited him to church and he came and he was really enjoying it because it was a really cool church and everybody was nice to everybody. And and, uh, we were playing basketball like two weeks after I invited him and, and I cursed a lot. My heroes were George Carlin and Richard Pryor and Steve Martin. These were my heroes. The Smothers Brothers, I know. Yeah, what? And, and I was playing basketball and I, and I was, every time I missed a shot, I would, you know, lay up a little word. And, um, and finally he stopped, he said, hey. I said, what? He goes, I thought you were a Christian. So what do you mean? He said, I thought you were a Christian, you, you're cursing. It was my first experience in not living what I taught, what I said. And not long after that, I felt like God began to convict me that I was the light in Jerry's world. It wasn't a very good light, but I was the only light in his world. His daddy beat his mommy and life was hard. And I was the only light and I didn't feel like a very good light. But here's the beauty. The beautiful thing is that I wasn't a good light, but Jesus in me was the best light, the only light. And Jesus through you can speak into people's lives in ways you never imagined. It is amazing. Just by being nice to someone, just by inviting them to a place where you found life, you can be the light in somebody's world. I think it's very cool. There's a great lesson. There's a cool illustration in the Old Testament that teaches how significant we are as the light of the world. There's, uh, Pastor Todd talked about this recently. In the tabernacle that God commanded Moses to build, there were two compartments. The first was called the holy place, and the second is called the holiest of all or the holy of holies. In the holy place, there were three objects of furniture. There was a golden altar of incense, a seven-branched candlestick, you've seen those, and the table of showbread. These items were all symbolic. They contained a message to the church of Jesus Christ. These things did contain, today we look back, it's a message to the church. And the scripture, the candlestick, always typifies or represents the church. The candlestick represents the church. And the candlestick had seven branches representing the sevenfold nature of the church. If you want to see what that is, go home and look it up. It's really interesting, but I don't have time tonight. The candles were night like the candles we're talking about with white candles with the wick. The candles were actually bowls with channels filled with oil. 
bowls with channels filled with oil, with little wicks were dipped in the oil and the light was produced by igniting the wick, which set in the oil, in the wick, and then fire was the result. So unless the candle, unless there was oil in the candles, unless the oil was ignited, the candles gave no light. And in the holy place, the candlestick was the only source of light in that room. If there was no light coming from the candlestick, it was utter darkness in that room. It was complete darkness. And folks, listen, that's us as the church. That's you as a follower of Christ. A brand new beginning follower of Christ. You are light to the world. And there's no other light in this world. We are the seven branch candlestick. We give light, the only light. When we are filled with oil, and that oil is set on fire, the church can give light only when it is filled with the Holy Spirit. We can give light only when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. You can give light only when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. The candlestick itself was incapable of producing light without the oil and without the fire. But when you are filled with the Holy Spirit and God ignites you, it changes everything. It changes everything. And what was impossible becomes possible. And little old you, in the middle of little old Jensen Beach, or little old Stuart, or little old Salerno was, was my situation. You can become the light and the salt. And the very people, when I stole money from a church down the road and gave them money to buy protection for my Salerno friends. I bought candy because I stole money from a church and I gave it away. Those kids got to hear Jesus from me. But I thought you stole stuff. You were like a, yeah, I know, but I don't anymore. How did you change? How did you change? The biggest, baddest kid in Salerno, his name was Wayne Barnell. I don't know if he's alive or not yet. He was a big guy. He had muscles where muscles didn't belong because he pulled, he pulled nets in for a living and he was huge and he was scary and he was probably just a scary guy, Wayne Bonnell. And he was a guy that I gave the most candy to because he was the biggest. So when I would run my mouth and somebody would come after me to hurt me, he would protect me because I bought him stuff. A couple of years later, I'm in high school now and I'm a Christian and Wayne comes walking by, big Wayne. Hey, what, what, what? I heard you know Jesus now. Really? Yeah, I do. What, what do I do? So we invited Wayne to a prayer meeting that was at Martin County High School out on the field. There were probably 12 groups of 15 kids each sitting in groups praying out there. God was moving. Remember that movie we just saw? The Revolution, Jesus Revolution? It was happening in Martin County High School in the early 70s. It was amazing. It was all over the country. Big Wayne came. There were riots going on in our school. It was kind of scary back then. And Wayne came and he sat down in the group and we had a prayer time and Wayne didn't know what to do. But he pulled up, he said, I got, I got, I'm gonna protect everybody. And he pulled a silver chrome 357 Magnum out of a paper bag. <laughs> I'm gonna protect you guys. Wayne, put it back in, go to your locker, put it in your locker and take it home. We got to pray with Wayne. A small group of misfits got to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world at Martin County High School back in the 70s. God was moving. Salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything to be trampled underfoot. Now listen to this. As Christians, our function as salt is to give flavor to the earth. Now here's what's interesting. I never read it like this, but listening to Derek Prince in one of his teaching, I like what he said, God enjoys this flavor. So I always took it as the flavors for all the people. We are the salt. We're, it, we're gonna make the world better. It's gonna taste better. It's gonna be more palatable for the world. But I like what Derek said. I had never seen it this way. God enjoys this flavor. God enjoys the earth with the salt on it that believers bring. So the presence of salt makes the difference 
you know how it's, if you eat a piece of steak and it's not that good, just a little bit of salt magically brings out the flavor in the steak. Yes, sir. Our presence on the earth makes the earth acceptable to God and brings his mercy on the earth because we are here. God continues to deal with the earth in grace and mercy rather than in war and judgment. Our presence makes the difference. Our presence makes the difference. A mom came up to me tonight and said, I'm worried about my daughter because the, fight, the world is going bad. The world is going bad and, and communism could take over and I'm worried about my kids. And it's awesome to know this. There are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of believers full of the Holy Spirit loving God. And God was gonna spare the city of Sodom for 10 faithful out of what is estimated to be 30,000 people. And not only will God spare this country because of the hundreds of thousands that are seeking God and loving him, God is just not gonna spare us. He's going to discipline us, hurt us because he loves us, prune us because we need to be pruned He's gonna bring us into a place and he's gonna shape us into a, 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 a shape that the world can see. This is God. God is moving. This is the real thing. This is God. God is moving. Anyone who gets near the move of God can't be untouched. They're touched. They're moved. And this is what God is doing today. Do not be afraid of what's coming down the pike. Be afraid of not being near to God yourself. Draw near to him and he'll draw near to you. Pray for your family. So the, the verdict is this. When you're worried about your family or you're worried about the future or you're worried about your finances or you're worried about your health or you're worried about anything, remember you are the salt. And all you do is you go to your father and you ask him to help you. You tell him what you need. And I love this scripture that very clearly says, do not worry about anything, but with prayer and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses understanding, can't even understand it, don't even know why it's there, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Worry makes you old. Trusting the Lord gives you life and makes you young. So trust him tonight, trust him tonight. I've got another hour and a half right here, but I'll sum up by saying this. So we come in here and we worship him and we feel his presence and that is good. But listen, if you do not go home and repent, repent of the things that you've been involved in, that put a barrier up between you and God. That's not what saves you, but that can keep you away from his presence. You're saved by his merciful grace to you and receiving that. But I know a lot of people who are saved who are still stumbling over the same things they were 20 years ago. It shouldn't be, it doesn't have to be. So seek him with all your heart. Shut the TV off. Quit taking comfort in things that are not necessarily bad, but they're not helping you. There's a new man, uh, what is the Disney show? The Mandar Mandalorian. It's a great shot. Quit taking comfort in things that are not helpful. Seek him first. Seek him first. There may be time to watch The Mandalorian. There may be time to enjoy the thing, but seek him first. And all the things that you're hoping for and dreaming of, he will add those things to you in proper measure at proper time. So to sum it up tonight, you are the light of the world. You are the only light in your world. Let him shine through you. Just a little at a time. Let him just take risks. Tell somebody you're afraid to tell. Just take risks and let them shine through you. That little risk, that's faith. That honors God and he will join you in that moment. You are the salt of the earth. As you seek him and let him fill you and let him work through you, 
He will amaze you. He will raise you up from a place of what you think is worthlessness. He will raise you up to places you never dreamed or imagined. And that's what he'll do. I just wanna pray with us tonight. We've already had prayer down here, so we're good, right? Just gonna pray and close us out, we good? All right, let's just pray with me. Father, thank you for this night. Thank you for your word, Father, which stands as the only truth we have, the only truth we need. Thank you, Lord, that this room is filled with the salt and light and those who are wanting to understand what that means and how that plays itself out and what we need to do. So I pray, Father, that you would continue to deliver people in this room from darkness, continue to move in power in this place, continue to draw the broken and the wounded and the hopeless to this place so that we can be the salt and the light to them that you've called us to be. Lord, I pray that everybody in this room over the next week or two would begin to experience what it's like to be used by you to help somebody. And that we really wouldn't be satisfied until we are seeing you move in us and work in us and move through us. Thank you, Lord. We love you so much. Thank you for this night. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today at Revive Us Now at our YouTube channel. Remember to click that subscribe button to Revive Church and share this video with a friend. And if you'd like to support this ministry, go to reviveusnow.com forward slash give.